Welcome back to the Indie Vets Happy Hour podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andrew Heller. I'm here with my co-host, Dr. Marissa Brunetti. Thank you for being here in your own house. Hey, Andrew. <laughs> Andrew, super excited to be here today for multiple reasons. One, you're here, and I don't ever get to see people in person anymore. Uh, two, I don't know if you guys have listened to the other podcast, but I've been talking about how this is happy hour and I haven't been drinking alcohol. But today we are actually enjoying a delicious local brew from Allentown, Pennsylvania, <sighs> Fegley's. If any of you guys are in the area, I highly recommend. You can pretty much get it from any local supermarket or craft beer store. And so. no, we're not paying. We're not being no, paid. No, oh, sorry. We're not this sponsored. Is not sponsored. <laughs> I just love Fagley's. <laughs> well, thanks for the beer, Marissa. Yeah. I appreciate it. It's, it's great to drink with you again. Uh, well, today we have a very special guest, um, someone who has not been on our show yet. Uh, her name is Dr. Kelly Dunham. And um, I'm going to let you introduce her. Yeah. I am so excited to welcome Kelly. Kelly is our was our second clinical leader after myself to join the team. She is our area medical director for our New York Metro team. So that includes Central and Northern New Jersey, as well as New York City and New York State. And she has been integral in, in making sure that our team functions appropriately. And like we've said before at Indie Vets, we, we have vets managing other vets. And we think that that's really important. So Kelly, thanks for being here. Can you tell us a little bit about where you went to school and what you've been doing since you graduated? Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I went to Ross. So Woo. like many of us, <laughs> go Rossies. Uh, and then I did my clinical rotations at the University of Illinois, uh, after which I joined Banfield. I worked there for a number of years, first as an associate vet and then chief of staff. And then I found my way to Indie Vets. Awesome. We're really and we're very happy. happy to have you. Very, very happy. All right. Well, the uh, the topic today that I wanted to talk about and um, have you on the show to talk about is heartworm. Okay. Mm. This is something that every veterinarian should know a lot about. Every veterinarian probably talks about numerous times a day to the point where we probably don't even realize we're talking about it anymore. True. And uh, you were so kind as to recently write to our entire team um, a little blurb about some of the changes that the American Heartworm Society has come up with. And we, I want to get to those today because I think every veterinarian listening to this can get something out of this. I think even people that are listening that are not veterinarians, you know, you probably hear from the vet techs and the veterinarians use monthly heartworm prevention. And I thought, you know, having Kelly on today, we can talk a little bit about it, give some background. We here are in the North and we don't see it as often, um, but Indie Vets now has doctors in the South. We have got doctors in Atlanta, in Central Florida, and um, very likely to be some some new areas in the South very soon. Um, so stay tuned for that. But you know, obviously, different places have different uh, prevalence. And I've actually heard from a doctor that worked with us um, that she was living in Texas, and heartworm was so bad there. She saw heartworms literally coming out of a dog's toe. Gross. That's how heavy the the load was. Um, so, you know, I don't have any of those stories personally, <laughs> <laughs> I'm thankful to say, um, but I, I, hopefully we can talk about some of our own experiences as well. And before we start, um, we're, we're going to ask some great questions to Kelly and get some info from her, but just so everyone knows, if you are not familiar with, and I'm sure you are, um, heartwormsociety.org is the greatest website. No excuses for not knowing the protocol for treatment of dogs and cats, um, with heartworm disease, just go there. Um, I typically print out the day, the table two, like day protocol, and I write my own dates in um, and check boxes for, for owners to check off as we're going through treatment. So just want to make a plug for heartwormsociety.org. Right. And if you do the same thing as Marissa and you have that sheet printed out somewhere, make sure you go back on because there have been some changes. Truth. And print out the new ones. And yes. hopefully we'll talk about that today. So Kelly, you being our uh, resident expert on heartworm, um, I wanted to know if you could actually just give us a little bit of a refresher on the disease, just in general, for maybe people who aren't veterinarians and, you know, who just have been doing this so long, they actually have forgotten all about it. Um, and maybe some, <laughs> some review of the, of the key life cycle um, components of, of the heartworm uh, organism. Yeah, so the first stages, one through three, start in the mosquito. So that's where it all begins. <laughs> Once the mosquito bites the dog, it injects that 
level uh, larval three stage into the dog, and then it can go into the larval four stage. And that can action actually happen really quickly in a couple of days. Um, so once it's in there, that's when all the problems start. <laughs> it starts migrating through the system and it can get up into the heart and into the lungs and start growing into those adult heartworms. So really every pet, that exists in the world is at risk for heartworm disease because those mosquitoes not only can be everywhere, but also we have a lot of pets that are traveling more now than ever before. Mm -hmm. um, not only shelter dogs that we're bringing up from the South um, to be rescued, but also just for regular trips, um, especially in this area, New Jersey and New York, we have a lot of snowbirds that go down to Florida and things like that for the winter. So it's definitely, it's definitely a risk for everybody. So how long would you say it takes from the time that the uh, mosquito bites to the time where you might see a positive test for a dog? You know, all of us are, are checking our dogs um, yearly, right? Right, so it can take up to six months to get a positive test um, once, we're in, once the dog is infected. Right. And is that because the worms um, reach their sexual maturity by six months, or is it just because that's when the load is heaviest? Uh, so, yeah, we're waiting for the, the sexual maturity to get the positive antigen tests on the snaps in hospital. Yeah, I know, like, when puppies come in to see me, um, I don't check them when they first come. And people are always asking, do I need to check for heartworms? And I'm just like, not yet. Um, and, you know, but we do put them on preventatives right away because they could be you know, it could be harboring some some little guys in there, right? That's a so, great segue. Yes. So, so what are the current prevention recommendations set forth by the American Heartworm Society? So right now, macrocytic lactones are our gold standard for prevention of heartworm disease. So those are things like, you know, our heart guards, ivermectin, Revolution, you know, and Revolution Plus. Uh, so those types of products that are going to be used every month. Also, we have some long-term products now available. So we have ProHeart 6 and ProHeart 12, which is really great, but those cannot be used in young or growing dogs or underweight dogs um, because they are actually stored in the fat. So you need to have either, you know, a normal body condition or an obese dog would be fine as well. <laughs> um, there's definitely a lot of those going around. <laughs> it's true. Right. And, you know, about ProHeart, you have to be certified to give that, right? Um, I know all of our indie vets are certified, correct? Absolutely, ProHeartCertification.com. <laughs> Just plug in that. Again, not sponsored by Not sponsored by, by Zoetis, but... Do you guys like using ProHeart, by the way? I like it. I think it's really great because so many people say that they're giving the prevention every month. And then when you're like, oh, it looks like you're due for more, they're like, oh, I have six more. <laughs> you're like, you shouldn't. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's really easy for it to slip through the cracks, especially with the year that's been happening. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. So I think it's really great. It gives clients an excellent option. And then when they're coming in for their biannual every six months, we're like, oh, you're due for ProHeart. Let's get that on board. And they don't even have to worry about it. Right. Yeah. And Marissa, you mentioned earlier before we did this that prevention is probably like a slight a misnomer. misnomer, right? Yeah, I think it is a slight misnomer. And I know that we're all extremely busy and don't have exceptional amounts of time to explain everything to clients. And so saying flea tick and heartworm prevention is an easy thing that flows off the tongue. But when I'm really trying to get someone to understand why their animal should be on heartworm, quote, prevention every month, I, I like to tell them that this isn't a repellent. Like it's not going to stop mosquitoes from biting their animal. It's not going to stop those little gross larvae <laughs> from entering their animal. So it's actually not, it's actually just preventing those larvae from maturing and becoming adult heartworms and actually causing disease. So those gross little larvae are like swimming around in your dog. And then every month you give the medication and it kills off those immature stages. So I think that visual helps people think like, ew, that's disgusting. Like, I don't want that happening in my dog. Sometimes I'll use that as a tactic to, to increase education for people and compliance. And, you know, being up here in the north, people are less concerned about heartworm, but they're there is heartworm in every single state, right? Yes, that's correct. It's everywhere. <laughs> heartworm is everywhere is and you everywhere. can't see it. <laughs> right, right. Okay. So what are the current testing recommendations for both dogs and cats? So for puppies, if they've been started on heartworm prevention, 
at eight weeks or older, then the recommendation is to test at six months. Uh, for pets that haven't yet been on heartworm prevention, if they're seven months or older, the recommendation is to test right away. And then for both groups, you're going to test in six months and then annually going forward. And for dogs, like the gold standard test that we're all using in-house, what type of test is that? So that's your standard ELISA SNAP test. Um, So really very accurate testing, which is really great. When you do get into a situation, though, where you have a positive, the first thing you always want to do is repeat the test and see if it's accurate or if you're having one of those very rare false positives. And then there's additional testing you can do as well with microfilaria testing, knots tests, and so on. Right. Absolutely. So Marissa, you were saying, what do you do when you get a positive? Well, first I was thinking like, the females are queens <laughs> in heartworm disease. And so they've only made an antigen test against the female heartworm antigen. And so if your heartworm infection is all females, you're gonna test positive on this antigen test. But if your heartworm infection is all males, we can get false negatives obviously too. But um, in dogs, more than likely there's at least one female. Right. And that's what we're testing for. We're testing for the the female antigen. But because cats have such a a small load of, of worms, right? Like there's a chance that it could be all male. True. And so we'll we'll get into cats a little bit later because they are their own beast, as we all know. Perfect. All right. So you come up with a positive. Um, you verified it with a second test. Maybe you've seen the microfilaria on the slide. What is the workup that you that is recommended? Prior to treatment. Prior to treatment. So it really depends on what clinical signs the pet is exhibiting and also on the client and what they are able and willing to do. So if you're having a positive test and the pet isn't otherwise clinical, you know, and you've confirmed it with additional testing, so say you did like the knots test or you saw microfilaria, then you can go ahead and start treatment. If you've, you know, done the testing, you've confirmed it and the pet is having clinical signs, then you need to try to stabilize those clinical signs first. So if we're having things like respiratory distress, you know, maybe we can start some bronchodilators, do fluid therapy for pets that that need it. Um, You know, it just, it really depends on the individual situation. And in terms of imaging, how important is that in the grand scheme of things? So imaging can give us more information about the degree of damage that's being done. So that, you know, x-rays can tell us about, are there, is the heart enlarged? Are there changes to the lung fields? Ultrasound is great because sometimes we can even visualize the extent of the, the burden of infection. Um, but you know, it doesn't change a lot on what we're going to do treatment wise. It just kind of can give us better expectations as far as recovery and prognosis. Yeah, that's a really great point. I think as we always say in vet med, right, every animal is different and you have to treat them based on, you know, anything underlying and how they're doing at that exact moment. I would say in a perfect, obviously in a perfect world, if everyone had gazillions of dollars, like I would do three view chest rads and full blood work and an echocardiogram on every patient before I treated them just to know what I was getting into. But Kelly's absolutely right. It's minimally going to change what you ultimately do. All right. Well, then let's talk about treatment. So in 2020, the American Heartworm Society updated the recommendations and I know there have been like at least one change since the previous one. Um, so let's talk about that. What is the protocol right now? So the current recommendations for heartworm treatment is to get started on a macrocyclic lactone. Uh, and then we're going to do that for two months prior to starting our malarsamine injections. Um, during that first month, while we're on the preventative, we can start doxycycline. And we're going to do that for a whole month as well. And the great thing about the doxycycline is that it kills the bacteria that lives inside the heartworm so that when we start killing the heartworms with our injections, the bacteria doesn't come out into the pet and it decreases the risk of getting anaphylactic reactions and death. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the new protocol, so I graduated in 2010. And so for the past 10 years, I've been doing doxycycline for a month and then immediately starting the malarsamine injections. But I guess they're finding now that you want to wait a whole month in between finishing doxy and giving the malarsamine, which is is interesting, I think. But they're finding that, that they're still dying like weeks 
after you stop the doxycycline, the bacteria. So that was interesting for me to figure out too. And there is some, um, when, when two drugs work better together, what's that word? Uh, synergistic. Synergistic. Yes. So there is some synergism between the doxy and the macrocyclic lactone together, right? So when they, they actually kill off the bacteria better together. Yeah, yeah. good point. And how many malarcimine injections are they recommending? Uh, three. So you would do the first injection and then you wait a month and then you do the second injection and then you wait one day and then you do the third injection. And of course, it's very important to keep these pets in cage rest during this time. Yes. And for how long after the injections do you need to keep them cage rested? Up to two months. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so they're finding that not doing appropriate activity restriction and allowing for pets to become overheated mm. is one of the two biggest risk factors of having sudden death. Yeah, that's, oh my God, I can't imagine creating my dog for two months. That's literally the reason why I give her <laughs> just so that every if she month. got it. Like, literally know. can't imagine keeping her. That's what drugs are for. <laughs> exact Truth. Truth. Yes. If you need drugs to keep your dog sedated during this time, please do not hesitate to reach out to your vet. So what's interesting is we had a doctor on our team who was treating a heartworm pet um, the other day and actually posted on our team's page that the pet was having some respiratory issues after getting the injection. So what were some of the things that she did, if you remember? This was in Maryland. So that's good to know, number one. So it wasn't well, it wasn't in the deep south, and I don't know the dog's history, but um, this was actually one week after injection, which I've actually never seen. Hmm. Usually I have seen reactions happen pretty quickly. Maybe they weren't doing proper exercise restriction. Exactly. So, so yeah, so I guess the dog came in laterally recumbent um, and to Kipnik, and they put it in oxygen, fluids, gave it corticosteroids and diphenhydramine, and the dog had improved, but her working diagnosis was that it was a thromboembolus. But we don't we don't actually have an update on that hmm. dog yet. It'd be nice to hear how that dog did. Yeah. So, you know, people always talk about the slow kill method. What are your thoughts on that? I know the American Heartworm Society frowns upon it, at least as a blanket, but what are your thoughts on it? I'm not a fan. And the reason is because we're starting to get more research out that is not definitive, but concerning that using the slow kill method might be contributing to resistant heartworm infections, which is something we've been starting to see overseas in Europe, as well as in the States and Mississippi. Oof. What if people can't, aff I mean, like, if you can't pay for anything, would you do the slow kill, you guys? I would. I, I think it's probably better than nothing, because at the very least, you're going to reduce the risk of transmission from that pet to another. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think, so I've also worked in shelter med, and for a while, I was seeing a lot of dogs being treated with two injections instead of three, just to cut down on the price. So I don't actually know the details as to the percentages, but to me, I've actually seen dogs be negative nine months later on the two injection protocol. So if if dogs come to me like that, I always, you know, always wait the full nine months and retest them because I have seen success. So we're not saying that every single animal should be treated with three injections, although that is what I, I love to do. You just follow the recipe. Yeah, the recipe is great and very easy. Heartwormsociety.org. <laughs> They should be sponsoring this one. They should. <laughs> Although I don't think they're a for-profit organization, so they probably don't have any money. Wait, we don't need money from them? Guys, Heartworm Society <laughs> <laughs> There's literally no excuse to not know the protocol. <laughs> yeah, they make it really easy. They have a little chart. You just print it right out, stick it on the wall. You're good to go. Okay. What else should we talk about then? We didn't talk about cats. True. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about cats. Let's talk about cats and heartworm disease because it's something we don't talk about a lot and people don't realize actually affects cats. And so, Kelly, let's focus a little bit on the differences between cats and dogs as hosts for heartworm disease. So the biggest difference is that cats are not a preferred host for heartworms. So most of the time when a cat becomes infected with heartworm disease, the larva never mature into the adult heartworm, mm -hmm. which is great for the cat, but the larval stages can still cause damages um, to the cat, to the lungs in particular. 
And when they do mature into adult heartworms, it's even harder for us to find out because a lot of times they have single sex infections. Um, so if you get two males in there or just one male, you're not going to be able to pick that up on your antigen testing. So cats are obviously end stage hosts. They typically, if there are adults, they typically don't reproduce in a cat. But what if you are suspecting that a cat that you would normally say has asthma, what if you're like, oh my God, this could this cat could have heartworm disease? You know, what tests do you need to do to possibly confirm that? It's funny that you say asthma because most cats that do have heartworm disease are misdiagnosed as having asthma or some sort of allergic bronchitis. So when we start to do testing, it's like I said, really challenging because of the same sex infections or having immature heartworm infections going on. There are blood testings that you can do still. You can still try to look for the microfilaria, but they're really hard to see. Um, you can also do a special heated antigen test. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that has to be do done through the reference lab, though. That's not something we can do in hospital. You, you would just send serum to the lab and request that. Yes. Yeah. And then imaging is also the next step for diagnoses. So taking x-rays to see if there's any physical changes going on, as well as ultrasound to try to look for any adult heartworms. So once you've, once you've diagnosed it in cats, um, you cannot follow the American Heartworm Society's recipe as we do for dogs. So how do you treat for cats? So the protocol that we have outlined so extensively is for dogs only. So for cats, they cannot get malarcemine injections. And so your only option, if there is an option at all, is surgery to extract those worms. Usually there's not a big worm burden in cats, like Kelly was saying, but one worm can cause horrible effects in a cat. So if you can't do surgery, you put the cat still on Revolution Plus or Advantage Multi every month and you monitor it for clinical signs. The good news about cats since they're end hosts is that the heartworms tend to not live as long. So fingers crossed if you can't do surgery and they're on Revolution or Advantage Multi every month that these heartworms will die in two to three years without much damage. But that's why I always tell people, like, I plug it. My cats have never missed a dose of heartworm prevention because I always say to people, like, even though your cat's indoor, I've gotten bit by mosquitoes inside too. So every cat is at risk for this. And most of the time, you're not going to know that your cat has heartworm disease. I spray my yard for mosquitoes. Do you? No, because all my animals are on prevention. But I still <laughs> I still don't want mosquitoes to bite me. Well, true, <laughs> true. Spraying for mosquitoes is still a really important step to help decrease the risk of heartworm prevention amongst other pets around the area that may be stray or outdoors. So it is still highly recommended by the American Heartworm Society. All right, so. We, we could talk about our own experiences. That's true. How many times have you guys actually treated heartworm up here in Philadelphia, New York, New Jersey? I've only treated it once. What was your experience like? It was actually really good. The client wanted to do everything. Uh, so we did, we got the initial snap test that was positive, repeated snap test, which was positive, looked for microfilaria in hospital, which we saw. Um, and then we talked about treatment options. The, the client actually didn't want to do any imaging. So at that time, wasn't up on the doxycycline knowledge, so didn't do that. But uh, I did do the macrocytic lactones and the injections and the pet responded really well. I think I've treated maybe four or five in my career up here and most of them have come to me already diagnosed and I just have to do the treatment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what about you? I know you worked in Texas, Marissa, for a long time, so not yes. a long time, but. Well, it felt like a long too time. Too long for you. It felt like a long time, <laughs> uh, number one. <laughs> Number two, before I moved to Texas, I actually did a lot of like rescue work. And so I was pretty familiar with treating heart and disease up here. But in Texas, I became an expert. And so down there, every time we tested antigen tests for dogs, we did microfilaria. So I got really good at finding gross microfilaria. It's kind of cool when you see it, right? It is kind of cool. And then you realize like gross, this is in a dog's bloodstream. But became very good at treating with the three injection protocol. I really like my pre-op method. Treating with amidocide or malarcemine is, is painful typically. And so when I do the injections, even if it's the day before, right, day one, day 30, and day 31, I'm putting an IV catheter in. They all get pain meds. They all get- What kind of pain meds? 
Usually hydro if I have it, like a, oh, wow. a decent, a decent pain meds. Hydro, like a full opioid or a partial, so buprenorphine. Wow. Always giving that before and also giving diphenhydramine and, and dexamethasone if they weren't on PRED already. And it's probably yeah. important to say, don't use NSAIDs, right? You're on Correct. PRED, yep. so don't use NSAIDs. Don't but. use NSAIDs. But with that protocol, the dogs have been really chill. It allows me to get the deep in injection that I need to. And knock on wood, I haven't had any issues with that. So I, I will say that my protocols tend to cost a little bit more just because of the catheter and, and all the injections, but they've turned out really well. Another reason to just use prevention. Exactly. <laughs> we it's don't expensive. To... I mean, treating heartworm can be thousands. You know, yeah. Thousands. Especially with the echo or the rads that we're doing on the chest and, you know, Absolutely. all the testing and the yeah. confirmatory testing. Yeah. So, yeah, for all of you people out there who have pets, use prevention. Use prevention. It's cheaper. I want to thank you, Kelly, so much for joining us today. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, it's been great having you, and I hope we have you on again. We're going to have you on so many yeah, more times. Yeah, I think you're an expert in lots of things, so we'll, we'll definitely lean on you for that. Um, and I want to thank everybody for listening. And if you like what you hear today, or if you just want to hear more, sign up, subscribe, even leave us a, a comment or a review. And uh, we will see you next time. Bye.